Good morning, grade 12. Today we are on chapter 2 of our novel North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell. I hope that you have found chapter 1 to be not as bad as you had anticipated. And uh, now that we are familiar, well at least to some extent, with our protagonist, it's time to get started into chapter two. Chapter two, the epigraph is Roses and Thorns. And it's actually a, a metaphor because the thorns, what, what is the connotation of thorns? Let's, let's start there. The connotations of thorns are something negative, are negative situations. In your life something that is uncomfortable that is almost unbearable and in this case thorns are referring to mrs hale's dissatisfaction with her position in life she's been married for years but she's reached a point where she is very unhappy with their with their lot in life and if it was up to her, she would be pushing Mr. Hale to achieving and acquiring more. Now, let's just quickly look. I mean, then obviously the, the, the roses would be referring to roses connotation. Sweet smelling, it's beautiful to look at, would be the, the positive, the pleasurable moments in life. Now, the little verse by Mrs. Herman says, by the soft green lights in the woody glade, on the banks of moss where thy childhood played, by the household tree through which thine eye first looked in love to the summer sky. And that verse is simply a description of nature. And it is nature as experienced, as loved by Margaret. Our theme, the natural order, nature. When in line one, and I'm, and I'm looking at the first four or five lines, Margaret was once more in a morning dress. And I, I don't know if I'm reading too much into it, but once more um, implies to me that She's wearing the same dress again. Travelling quietly home with a father who had come up to assist with wedding. Travelling quietly, is Margaret in a pensive mood? Is she just sitting and reflecting on what she has left behind and where she is going to? Her mother had been detained at home by a, and I want you to pay attention to this, by a multitude of half reasons, none of which anybody fully understood except Mr. Hale. So the, the reasons the mother gave for not attending um, are very weak and they are invalid. But follow in line five. Mr. Hale was perfectly aware that all his arguments in favor of a new gray satin gown which was midway between oldness and newness, had proved unavailing, and that as he had not had the money to equip his wife afresh from top to toe, she would not show herself at her only sister's, only child's wedding. So Mrs. Hale has chosen not to attend the wedding because she didn't have a new dress. I think on the one hand, that bears testament to the financial limitations. On the other hand, is it not also a bit of pride on the part of Mrs. Hale? Because surely um, this is family after all, and your presence should be more important than, than what you're wearing. Okay. But on the flip side of the coin, if you go down to line 11 on the flip side but it was nearly 20 years since mrs shaw had been 
the poor, pretty Miss Berriford, and she had really forgotten all the grievances that that of the unhappy except that of the unhappiness arising from the disparity of age in married life. So Mrs. Shaw had been married for 20 years. Um, remember the maiden surname was Beresford. And what those lines are telling us is that Mrs. Shaw has forgotten what it's like not to have plenty. And that is telling me that she didn't think of her sister. She didn't consider that maybe Mrs. Hale needed a new outfit. She had become quite caught up and quite self-absorbed in her, her luxurious lifestyle. On page 14, um, starting in line 2, this is still Mrs. Shaw thinking of her sister. Married for love. What can dearest Maria have to wish for in this world? So the discrepancy between the two sisters becomes apparent. Mrs. Hale married for love and Mrs. Shaw married the much older man who was able to provide her with comfort. And because a sister married for love, Mrs. Shaw is still under the impression that she doesn't need anything else because she has whatever, she, because she has the best that anybody could have in the world and that, and that is love. Funnily enough, there is a, a saying in English, when love, no, when poverty comes in through the front door, love goes out through the back door. I don't think you've heard that one. Something for you to think about. But you know what I say to my, the girls in the class? Make your own money. We jump down to line 18. Margaret's heart felt more heavy than she could ever have thought it possible in going to her own dear home. The place and the life she had longed for for years. So why would she have the sense of heaviness? Should she not be elated and ecstatic to finally be returning home? But we are going to see that the home she had in her mind, in a, in a mind's eye from her early childhood is not, not really what is the true situation now. And she is driving home with her father in a carriage. And if you go to the last line, line 34 on page 14, it says, she went back over the open and avowed circumstances of her father's life to find the cause for the lines that spoke so plainly of habitual distress and depression. So the father has, has aged and he has lines, wrinkles on his face. And, the and she is straight away aware what the main cause of his depression is. It is the fact that he is missing his son. That he longs for his son. That he hasn't seen his son, Frederick, in years. And from line 3 to line 9, poor Frederick thought she sighing. Oh, if Frederick had been but a clergyman instead of going into the Navy and being lost to us all. And that's our first clue that something terrible happened in the life of Frederick. Because Frederick isn't dead. But Frederick isn't a part of the lives of the Hale family. 
I wish I knew all about it. I never understood it from Aunt Shaw. I only knew he could not come back to England because of that terrible affair. Poor dear Papa, how sad he looks. I am so glad I'm going home to be at hand to comfort him and Mama. So from the very outset, Margaret's role is not to be simply the child who will be taken care of by her parents, but Margaret's role starts off as being one to provide comfort and solace to her parents. So already I feel that the parent-child relations are slightly inverted here. It's not quite as it should be. And I, I even want to go so far as to say that, that I feel that the, the natural order is, is not quite natural here. Parents should take care of their children, not vice versa. Also, on page 15, if you go down to line 18, where we have a physical description of Margaret. Now, you remember in chapter 1 that when she was modeling the shawls, Edith shawls, it was said that she was quite an attractive girl. And here we've got quite a bit of a contradiction. And I'm not going to go into that. I just want to, to draw your attention in line 18. Margaret was more like him than like her mother. And people, and sometimes people wondered that parents so handsome should have a daughter who was so far from regularly beautiful. So I think it's, um, it, it, it's quite in contradiction to what was said in chapter, chapter one. And I think beauty after all is in the eye of the beholder, forgive the, the cliche there. The last four lines on page 15 again draws our attention to the natural world. The description there is of Margaret returning home. The forest trees in line 31 were all one dark, full, dusky green. The fern below them caught all the slanting sunbeams. The weather was sultry and broodingly still. And it's such a wonderful, peaceful description of nature and it and don't forget the verse at the start of the chapter reminded us or indicated that that was something that margaret enjoyed terribly she she was at peace there and it carries on all the way into chap in onto excuse me onto page 16. if you go down to line 5 on page 16 it says she took a pride in her forest. Note that, that sense of possession that she has. And again, pride. Line 17 focuses on the thorn. Her mother, her mother always so kind and tender towards her, seemed now and then so much discontented with their situation and thought that the bishop strangely neglected his episcopal duties in not giving Mr. Hale better living and almost reproached her husband because he could not bring himself to say that he wished to leave the parish and undertake the charge of a lodger. So there we have it. Mrs. Hale is dissatisfied. She is not happy that her husband has this small um, congregation that he is in charge of. And I think here yeah, it, it extends further than just their financial status because the larger the parish, the larger the, the, the salary, I suppose. But also in terms of status, she would have liked something more for her husband and clearly she knew this she knew this from the beginning but now she's reached a point where she really does want more um in line 26 at each repeated urges urgency of his wife that he would put himself in the way of seeking some preferment 
Margaret saw that her father shrank more and more. So what's happening here? Two things. One, Mrs. Hale is nagging. <laughs> I don't know if you're going to say that's stereotypical for women. Um, but the mother is nagging. And every time she does that, the father shrinks into himself. We see that there is, on some level, the desire probably to please his wife. But at the same time, Mr. Hale is torn. He feels torn between his job, what he sees as his job, and then his duty towards his wife. Line, line 29 says, She, meaning Margaret, strove at such times to reconcile her mother to Hilston. So I think what that's telling us is that Margaret wanted her mother to accept her lot in life. This is where daddy is or father is. This is where you are. So make the most of it. You've been here for years. And clearly the mother is having none of that. Um, I also feel that the shrinking of the father, I don't think it's so much physical, but I think that it is affecting his manhood and it's definitely crushing his spirit. Um, we, I then want to draw your attention to page 18. On page 18, at the top, Gormans, said Margaret, because we've kind of jumped a little bit now. The, the, remember, we've, we've skipped a, pay, a page, and so it's a conversation that's taking place now. Are those the Gormans who made their fortunes in trade at Southampton? Oh, I'm glad we don't visit them. I don't like shoppy people. I think we are far better off knowing only cottages and laborers and people without pretense. And straight away that tells us that Margaret thinks that people in the trade are pretentious. Pretentious, why? Because they have now made money and so now they think that they are better than they actually are. And this draws our attention straight away to the theme of social class. And Margaret I want you to decide, is Margaret a snob? Is she a snob? Does she relish her, her social position? And does she, does she look down on people? Why is it that she says we are far better off knowing only cottagers and, and laborers? People who are clearly defined as being um, lower in social ranking. If you go to line 9, and I think it's all the way down to line 13, no. Um, I call mine a very, compre this is Margaret replying to her mom, a very comprehensive taste. I like all people whose occupations have to do with the land. All right? I like soldiers and sailors and the three learned professions, as they call them. I'm sure you don't want me to admire butchers and bakers and candlestick makers, do you, Mama? So there's quite a bit of um, sarcasm, I, I feel, there. And all I'm seeing, the red flag just saying social class. All right. Um, from line 20 to 25, still on page 18. Margaret goes outside and what we see here is that she is totally fascinated once again by the natural world. Line 27 all the way down I think to the top of page 19 shows how stereotypically Victorian Mrs. Hale was. It starts off by saying in 27, 
Mrs. Hale had never cared much for books and had discouraged her husband very early in their married life in his desire of reading aloud to her while she worked. She didn't like that. At one time, they had tried backgammon as a resource. It's a game, right? But as Mr. Hale grew to taking an increasing interest in his school and parishioners, he found that the interruptions which arose out of these duties were regarded as hardships by his wife, not to be accepted as the natural conditions of his profession. And so what we see here is that Mrs. Hale did not share the passions or the interest of Mr. Hale. So they, they are not having that commonality. You know, clearly she's not someone that he can discuss things with. And if he cannot discuss with his wife, then with who will he discuss these things? And line two gives us, in a way, the answer on page 19 because it says, So he withdrew. And that's quite, quite sad because he would rather spend time by himself in his study, reading, and so on. Um, now we see how similar Margaret is to her father and how different she is to her mom. Because in line 6 to 9, when Margaret had been here before, she had brought down with her a great box of books recommended by masters or governesses and had found the summer's day all too short to get through reading she had to do before her return. So, Margaret is more interested in reading, even if it is prescribed reading. She is interested in reading. And I think a real Victorian lady just does and dabbles in a little bit of reading, um, not, not too much. If you go to line 24 on page 19, Um, it's actually starting in the latter part of line 23. She wondered if she might venture to put a question on a subject very near to her heart and ask where Frederick was now, what he was doing, how long it was since they had heard from him. So clearly the brother is estranged from the family. It's not a natural situation where a sister has no knowledge of her brother where he's not even spoken about in the family. So that is something for concern. But a consciousness, please listen, but a consciousness to her mother's delicate health and positive dislike to Helston all dated from the time of the mutiny in which Frederick had been engaged, the full account of which Margaret had never heard and which now seemed doomed to be buried in a sad oblivion. So, there we finally have some insight. Frederick was involved in a mutiny. We know Frederick is in the Navy. And straight away, we get the big picture. Because any kind of mutiny, any kind of theme of rebellion is punishable by death. Now, I also want to draw your attention to two other points in line 27. The mother's delicate health. And I don't know if you're going to disagree with me, but I feel at the beginning of the novel, the mother's health was maybe more psychological, this, the, the, the delicate state of her health. You know, Victorian women were so prone to fainting and dizzy spells, etc., etc. Um, so I, I don't believe that she was, she was really ill. But clearly there they were one or two health, health issues. And then the second thing, because that, that is maybe an, a, a very vague bit of foreshadowing that I want you to be aware of, the mother's delicate health. Delicate, implying susceptible to becoming ill. And then the second one is the mother's positive dislike to Helston. 
So there's nothing wrong with the place, there's nothing wrong with the, with the society. It's just that it is small and small equates to low social standing and equates to um, limited financial resources. Page 20, we're going to go into 20 and 21. And I'd like to start in line five because we, we were speaking now about Frederick, so we just carry on with that, that, that thought. Frederick was always spoken of in the rare times when his name was mentioned as poor Frederick. So there's this, this idea of, of sympathy. His room was kept exactly as he had left it and was regularly dusted and put in order by Dixon, Miss Hale's maid. So it's almost like a memorial to Frederick and yet he's, he's still very much alive. Then we also should pay attention to from the, the, the whole discussion around Dixon, which is from line eight. Um, I think it goes all the way down to line 24. And the discussion about her having been with Mrs. Hale and Mrs. Mrs. Shaw before they were married, when they were still the Beresford sisters. And I want to draw your attention to the fact that their father was Sir John. So, socially, they do come from landed gentry. They are probably an old aristocratic tie somewhere along the line. And what's interesting is that Dixon, who is only the maid, carries with her throughout the novel that air of not not maybe importance but that air of being superior to workers and to laborers because she and her people come from better she has worked for better so please just make sure that you are familiar with the whole dixon background um then from line 25 all the way down to the end of the page, Margaret could not help believing that there had been some late intelligence of Frederick unknown to her mother, which was making her father anxious and uneasy. So straight away she starts wondering, did her father receive any bad news? Um, he's a sensitive man. He is easily distracted. And she... As a child who should be, maybe not impervious, but shouldn't be too much worried, she's worried and she is concerned over her father's well-being. She's concerned because her mother has delicate health and our protagonist's shoulders become burdened from her arrival. Um, further, evidence, further evidence of the father's state of mind is seen on the last page of our chapter page 21 line 2 mr hale did not go out among his par parishioners as much as usual he was more shut up in his study was anxious for the village postman so shut up in his study implying he wants to be alone anxious for the postman that's real evidence of his worry. He is obviously waiting for some correspondence, which tells us that there is definitely something afoot. Um, and then, you know, Mr. Hale is walking around in the garden, and then when we go to line 12 to 14, again, just mention of the, the natural world. world. And I, I think it's constantly included as a reminder to the reader the importance and the beauty of the natural world in this part of the world. Um, line 16, 
But Margaret was at an age when any apprehension, not absolutely based on knowledge of facts, is easily banished for, for a time by a bright sunny day or by some happy outward circumstance. And what that is telling me is that because Margaret is still young, if there isn't any concrete evidence for her to be worried about something, it kind of slides to the back of her mind and she, she enjoys the beautiful day. She's focused on more positive things. And, and I think that is probably part of youth. Youth is inherently positive and, and happy, as you well know. So, I would like to conclude this chapter by looking at the last three lines. Margaret, determined to, to sketch. It starts with line 28 in the middle. Accordingly, she was busy preparing a board for painting one morning when Sarah, the housemaid, threw wide open the drawing room door and announced Mr. Henry Lennox. So why has Captain Lennox's brother, who she spoke only briefly to at the home of the Shaws, why has he come to visit Margaret? More about that in our next chapter.